punch the TV. <laughs> <in>. <laughs> All right, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Today is Wednesday, November 15th. The time is 7.07. .07. If everyone would stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Let the role reflect that um, all members are present, excluding Vince, which is hoping to join us later. Uh, was this meeting properly noticed? Yes, it was. The minor is being recorded as well. Welcome visitors. Uh, is there any public comment at this time? Right. So then we'll move on to the highlight on you. We've got the high school marching band and band teacher Sean Conway and a couple of the students. Welcome. Thank you for coming, guys. I know the setup doesn't work, but I'm just going to have this one. Hello, everyone. Um, happy to see you. Uh, it's kind of my annual quick uh, recap on how all things went uh, marching season. I know you all are very busy with all the things that you're doing, both in real life and for the district from around here. So I just wanted to take a little bit of time um, to kind of highlight the, the successes that our kids have had and kind of um, for those of you that have seen me for a number of years here talking about this showcase kind of uh, the growth that we've been able to make over the years here. Um, so, I don't have this in too. If you do, you say it. There's a video hidden in here too. So, um, first, uh, just a couple things about like how our season works. Um, we start every year with a band camp in August where we take a week and kind of begin learning the fundamentals of how we're marching, doing stuff. Um, just hosted right into high school. We don't go off site or anything like that. We're super excited to finally have turf field done because that's going to be a total game changer for us. Um, so we're very excited about that for this next year. Um, then we have the uh, Hammond Heartland Days Parade that we go right into in the community dinner, which that's just a photo of the, uh, if you were there, that was the uh, little wall storm that came and blew every piece of music we could have possibly brought all over the place. So luckily we got out before the rain, but that was a good memory. Um, and we perform uh, halftime at the homecoming football game. Um, and we have three additional uh, festivals that we perform at. Um, we perform the show we work on during the season. Um, one of those is right next door at Baldwin Woodville. The other one is at Hudson High School. So we can join show with Hudson and River Falls that they put on in their stadium. And then finally, we cap off our season with a performance at the uh, Youth in Music uh, Marching Band Championships at U.S. Bank Stadium in Minneapolis. So, pretty awesome experience. The kids get to meet. We walk right past the Vikings locker room. We're waiting in the tunnel, getting ready to go. Um, you know, so as a Vikings fan, that's a huge highlight for me. As some of my kids, they're just like, one kid wanted to gritty, but I go, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> Packer fans are tolerant. They like that it's inside of these. Um, so the production we did this year, we did a show. We did something kind of a little bit different. You know, we kind of stuck with the same level of like um, popular music tunes that we've done in the past. You know, where we have um, we played "Smells Like Teen Spirit" by Nirvana, which we'll play a little bit of that for you um, today. Um, "Holiday" by Green Day, and then "El Gato" is this kind of random, like Latin-sounding arrangement. Um, which is really exciting, kind of added a little bit of musical variety to what we did. Um, and one of the things we talked about this year is that we wanted to um, take the group, and previously in all of these years that we've done this, we've just taken the group and we've performed in what's called exhibition. So basically think of exhibition as um, you go, you do your thing, you'll get feedback from a judge, but no one writes down a number, you're not technically competing um, or getting evaluated and compared against anyone else. Um, so that was something we, we talked about, you know, it's like, we've been doing this like seriously, um, since 2019, you're like, you know, I'm really confident with where you are all at. Um, I would like to be able to at least let's get something on paper. Let's go for a score. On one of these things, not because we're trying to, to beat anyone here. That's not the goal, but like, just so we have a benchmark for our own growth. 
uh, going forward. So what that meant is we ended up having, um, you know, a, a, a name that was related to kind of something design wise. And so we went with tessellations, the idea behind that being like tessellations being shapes, patterns, grids. Um, and the idea is then visually we can show that tessellation idea by being just like a total grid um, that ends up reshaping in different ways and then ultimately completely splitting into like curves, lines, follow linear formations, all those types of things. So the reason you can use a whole bunch of different visual ideas um, out there, which in a competition we would get credit for, which would help boost our score. And like that's what some of the stuff that I know from being involved. So we had a little bit more intensive design. Um, and the kids, like we had stronger students this year. Like um, we had 33 students in advance, which is pretty consistent with where we've been. Um, but one of the biggest changes is we had 24 veteran members. So that's kids that this is not their first year doing this. Um, and that's up from four from last year. And, you know, just like any time you're trying to establish a culture or build anything up, having not having to start at ground zero every single year is huge. You can build on those success. You have more role models around for those kids. Awesome stuff. We had nine seniors. We had the largest drum line we've ever had um, with 10. And because we had this much experience, we were really able to take the visual design, like the marching, how they're doing the formations, like extra dance moves. We were able to take that up a whole other step, which was awesome. The kids loved the challenge. Instead of doing small baby steps all the time, like I kind of had them hauling a little bit. These guys can kind of talk about that a little bit. Um, they had more fun. The program was more engaging for everybody. And, you know, we were consistently getting feedback from judges, even when we weren't doing like getting a score that they're just very impressed with the progress that these kids have shown from year to year because they're they're evaluating us very much the same at, at these annually um so like we're even getting recognition from um the judging community on the growth that our students are showing in these things so like i mentioned we had an increase in the the, the demand of the visual design so demand just being i think bigger bigger steps more pictures, more complex pictures that are harder to get clean. Um, thanks to uh, uh, Olatana building a new school, they were auctioning off old items. So we were able to buy a um, old drum major podium, like a legitimate drum major podium from them instead of using our, my family's uh, three step paint step ladder anymore. So now we're like a real, real, real band. We had a real podium. Um, and thanks to Pete for his, uh, Family uh, picking that up, and then uh, grounds crew for actually making the trip to on to go grab that. That was huge. Um, appreciate the support there. Uh, last year, we purchased um, drumline equipment from River Falls. We were able to use that this year. We had so much stuff and so many kids, and we had to utilize a trailer when we traveled instead of just squeezing everything onto the bus. Um, and and the kids had gotten so used to what they were doing. Um, my brother decided to get married on uh the same day as the Baldwin Woodville show and to make sure that I beat was there he made me the best man too so I was unfortunately not able to be at our very first show of the year uh which had this happened three years ago I would have just like canceled the show and like totally stressed out everything but um with the help of like Ben ha Ben Helmreich at the middle school and actually Rachel Hansen who has like marching band experience from uh when she was a student at Baldwin we were able to get the kids to the show, get them set up, they knew exactly what to do, and they performed a really great uh, first run. Like, and that's something we couldn't have done a few years ago. Um, and you know, one of the things that I think helps us to be as successful and grow as much as we do is like right now our our, our schedule. Um, kids don't have to be in marching band if they don't want to be, or if their schedule just doesn't work for them. You know, we have the marching band class and like what we call fall wind ensemble, which is just an optional ensemble thing for people who still want to do band, but maybe they're in volleyball and they have a lot of competitions, meets and matches on Saturday. And that just does not work for them. Um, and so you've got, you don't have a time, you've got 33. Well, obviously I'd love for those, all these numbers to be bigger all of the time, but you've got everybody, you know, rowing in the same direction every single time committed to being there. And so the games that they're able to make are just, that much greater. Um, and so being able to have that flexibility of two groups um, like that in the fall has been, and throughout the year really has been a huge benefit for us. Um, and like I said, that competition piece, 
Um, just to kind of show, this is too small to read, but I figured I'd throw it in there anyway. Um, but what this is, is the scoring recap. So just to quickly go through what some of these pieces are, because I know this is a lot of me talking. This isn't so close to take that long. But um, so you've got all the different schools that are there competing. They're separated by class, which is based on school size. Um, so we were the third group to go on there between after Hutchinson and Antigo. And so we're evaluated, you can see here, in different categories. Music performance ensemble, that's how well do you play the music you have. Okay? Um, and I can get into the left and right numbers a little bit later, but basically the biggest gray box on the far right is that final score. Okay? Music general effect is like, how does the music and the, the, the pictures you're making on the field work together to create an impact? Percussion, how's your drumline doing? Visual performance, how well are you marching? How clean are your pictures? Um, are you looking the same when you do it? Visual general effect is kind of like the other general effect, but on the picture side of it, less so the music side. And then the last one is color guard. Because we don't rehearse outside of the school day, we don't have a color guard. So, you know, being upfront and honest with the kids, we're just like, hey, just so you know, like we're going to get a goose egg there. And that's fine. Because okay? we're not competing with anybody. We don't have a color guard. They can't give us credit for us for a color guard. We don't have it. Um, but the things I'm really proud of, you know, like if you look at these kids, and again, it's not about the competition, but you know, when you're successful, it's kind of nice. If you look at the music performance number, all of these programs have been established for much longer than we have. We've, like I said, we've really only been doing this for four years. And in the music performance category, um, we had a 13.1, we beat two other groups. Like, and we beat them by four tenths with seems like not a lot but it's kind of a big gap one point gap is a especially big jump um and if you look all the way towards the end you know yes we did get fourth place in our class okay we got last place overall but if you look at our final number it looks like we had uh 58.788 the next lowest score 59.788 and if you look at that color guard column there are three additional points there that we have that no one else did. So if I had just given one of, like, we've got a couple band kids that are in the dance team, part of me was like, you know, if I just give them a flag, have them run out of the football field and make them stay up for seven minutes, like, you know, that might have been just, you know, that's not the point, though. But, you know, but that's, that's the thing. They're doing everything that they're being asked to do so well that, like, even with, like, one arm tied behind our back, we're hanging in there with somebody who could have been doing this for a while. So I'm, I'm really proud of all the work that all the kids have put into this um, over the years. And this was just, this was, this was the last show that we did before the U.S. Bank Stadium thing. So this was really nice, kind of like highlight and a good standard for us to set for things going forward. Um, so next we'll give um, Students, we have um, Lily Hansen, who was our drum major this last year, and Harper Mond, who is uh, one of our senior center drummers, liberal seniors, but um, give them a chance to kind of talk about their experience and a little bit, uh, yeah, before we move on. We've got a little clip of the show to show them, too. Uh, hello, my name is Harper Mond, and I was one of the snare drums on our drum line. And this marching man, I'm sorry, I'm a senior. Um, this marching man season was really cool. It was a big step up from what we did last year, uh, which was my first year in the marching man. Um, the drill was, it was a challenge, but it was something that I think we met really well. Um, it was a lot more challenging than last year. I know that for sure. Um, and something I really liked about Marching Man was um, that in percussion, we worked like closely together as a section. I'm guessing it's the same with all the other sections we do. But a lot of the people that were in my section, I have grown to know like really well. Um, some of them, I don't know if I would have really hung out with them before Marching Man, but um, now I'm really good friends with a lot of the people that were in my section, so that's really cool. Um, the events were really fun. Uh, we all got a cram into a bus, 
and perform for all these other schools. And um, it was really fun to hear what the judges had to say and work from that and incorporate what they said into our next performances. Um, and especially the U.S. Bank Stadium trip was really fun. Um, it was really cool to be in such a big building performing for so many people because, um, you know, as a high school student, like I don't usually <laughs> do that that much. Um, but it was really cool to like be where the Vikings are playing, even though my family is a Packers family. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's really cool to you know, like see Vikings games on TV and just be like, wow, I was there on that field. And it was, we also got to take a trip to the Mall of America in between while we were waiting to hang out with our friends. And then we went back and watched all the shows, and they were all really cool. And I think it was helpful to watch them, especially because they have really cool ideas that I think that we could also incorporate into our um, drills and movements. Um, I don't know if I can Sure. Hi, I'm Lily Hansen. I was the drum major this year, and I'm also a senior. Uh, this is my first year of being in marching band and being appointed as drum major. It was, even though it was my first year, it's definitely a big leadership role stepping into. Um, it definitely helped me because I am going to pursue music education next year for college and being in a leadership role where I have to basically, when maybe comment will be gone, I would be the one to run class and helping students whenever, even though I wasn't the most educated on marching band, I was still able to give my input in a more professional way. Um, but yeah, I was able to see them from 20 feet back, conducting them every single performance we had, and seeing the growth from our first show at Baldwin to US Bank, it was really great seeing them, just adding more and more drill each performance, and then later getting the feedback from our judges was really great to hear. Um, and I definitely think the highlight of us, our performance was at US Bank, where we had more of a completed show with all, with drill having for all three of our songs and being able to be in much of a bigger space when usually we were at performing at homecoming or just performing on like normal high school football fields and then being in more of a bigger space where you could definitely hear yourself and the corner where I see yourself on the drumlotron was really crazy. <laughs> and it was definitely just jaw dropping like how everyone was able to come together and for our final performance, we were able to produce something really great together and having fun at the same time, where I definitely made a lot more friends this year just by being drum major and being someone some people could look up to, even though this was my first year. And just being a senior in general, everyone was able to, some people were able to look up to me and, <laughs> and I was able to still make some friends in the meantime. But this year has definitely inspired me um, to want to join marching band in the future, and I'm wanting to join next year when I attend Eau Claire for the Blue Bulls, which is one of the biggest marching bands in almost the state with almost 500 people. So I'm very excited about the next year. Thank what what instrument do you play? Um, I'm a percussion, okay. and then I do piano also for band. Awesome. So we have just a little bit of, uh, you can just won't watch all of this, but um, this is our performance from U.S. Bank Stadium. So like everything you're seeing here gets blasted up on the Jumbotron. And I, I told the kids, like, you don't get credit for finding yourself. <laughs> don't look at it. So you forget you fail band. Um, so, but they did a really excellent job. And this kind of shows you just the, 
The audio is a little wacky, but um, part of that's the stadium. But let me share so Max can see that. Luckily, I'll just have to begin this intro. You know, if there's audio coming out through, there should be audio. There should be audio. Let me pause. Yeah. Well, since getting that set up for the sake of um, being respectful of you all's time, um, one thing. When I got here, like two, that probably was it. Sixteen or whatever. Sixteen or seventeen. Like yeah. right here, um, we did three sets. Box open, box close, SEC. So, just where have you been able to go in this amount of time? It's just like awesome. We'll just look, we can watch the start of this one. We'll... Basically, so that, that that was kind of their full work and everything that they put together there. Um, yeah, just so many things that I'm just like very proud of that they did uh, with all of it there. Um, just, yeah, sorry, I'm like at a loss for words right now for, for that, but there you go. All right. Um, so it's kind of like what happens for us now that this type of thing is all is all wrapped up. Um, you know, going forward for next year, like the excellence and attention to detail, you know, we're going to continue to um, ramp that up and create, increase the amount of demand and things like, you know, the thing that, I, that that's that I love about like band, marching bands specifically is that, you know, we don't have anyone riding the bench. Like if you're in the group, you're on the field, like everyone's got to get there all together. You can't just like ride the coattails of um, a superstar to get there, you know. Put, it puts a lot of pressure on our upper class and make sure they're, you know, they're they're helping their uh, freshman brothers and sisters out to like really bring them forward and, and, and you know, help create the legacy that they want to be proud of going forward. Um, and so, 
you know, kind of in the spirit of that, and even wanting to be better, you know, we had an end of the year survey, and one of the things that, you know, one of the questions on there is, would you be interested in an after school rehearsal, like adding something like that? You know, we have a the turf stadium that makes things a little bit easier. You know, you just go out after practice, and it's not going to be a dewy, wet, muddy mess. Um, and there was overwhelming interest in that. You know, once something like that is available, once we have time outside of the school day, outside of like the normal business working hours, um, then we can potentially work on having like a relationship with UW River Falls or UW Eau Claire to coordinate. Maybe they send a couple students over to work with our students. So now it's no longer just me, you know, writing the drill, organizing the rehearsals. Like they can help give more individualized attention on the field while they also get learning experience for when those music ed students have to go out and teach their own marching band. So we can kind of create a cohesive um, kind of synergistic relationship there. Um, kind of in the process of still upgrading a few of those instruments. Um, but, you know, again, the other thing that's exciting about this is like, yeah, we want to have, make sure they have great experiences here, but we want to, you know, make sure they're ready to go out in the world and continue to know, do those things, you know, thinking like district mission and vision things. And the picture on the left there, um, we talked about the Blue Gold Marching Band. Those are four SEC, SEC students who, I guess, make up 1% of the 400 or 500 person. <laughs> um, of UW Eau Claire Marching Band. Uh, two of them recent grads, Mikey Hansen, who spoke here last year, and uh, Lucy Beck. And then we've got Carly Hetrick, who's a former drum major, Jazzy Geiger, a trumpet player. Um, Carolyn Lent, if you know her, she, her uh, uh, daughter Caitlin is in the Color Guard at UW Oshkosh's band. Uh, we've had a number of students who have helped be involved in getting um, the first couple of years of River Falls' marching band. As that has come back to life. Um, and so we have kids that are really starting to find their thing that are then going out, you know, having a great time, making more friends, making great connections with this. Um, and so, yeah. Um, now that that season's done, if you're interested, we do have a concert on Monday, January 8th. Um, it's a little later than normal for us because we wanted to help uh, Niche get in a, a dance team thing, but um, make some, uh, of utilize the auditorium that way and preventing from having to move the shells back and forth very quickly overnight. Um, it should be a great time, awesome music. Um, yeah, so that'll feature all both the high school ensembles that we have at that time there. And then, um, just kind of you know, thank you for your time for tonight and your support um, through this stuff, you know, helping to make sure that, you know, the referendum and things passed this year, like that was a huge deal for us to, just to, you know, Football, soccer, track, get to most kind of visibly use that use that space. But, you know, that's something that, um, you know, I don't have to tell the kids to make sure that they bring shoes for rehearsal and then shoes for like the rest of the day at school, like it's by ed class, so that, you know, they're not getting destroyed in the swamp. You know, they can practice on the stuff that they're going to perform on when they go to these other shows. Um, and just the expansion that we ended up getting in the lobby is just going to make the experience after our concerts for our kids so much better. So, um, Thank you for all you've done in giving these kids these these opportunities, and thank you for giving me the time to come talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks guys. Good luck Thanks. next year. Thanks. 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 Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, moving on to comments by board members and superintendent. The first one is special meeting update. No, for you, President. So we brought uh, the question to the community, and there was about 120 that came to vote on if the daycare is approved by the property of Daisy Hill. And it was voted down 74. 72 to 40. So good attendance if the people were interested. Lots of, we have great presentations, Tim and Michaela and Jen gave wonderful presentations with a lot of good data and so that was the results. 
right, so moving on to strategic planning committee. Where are we at? We spent tonight's meeting reviewing the survey responses. Now we only had like 70 some from the community. The parent one had how many? Parents? 395. Yeah, it was pretty well. Um, and so we got stuff that reinforced what we're doing, a few things that were comments that weren't knowledgeable about what, you know, they were saying, well, you should do this. And well, we actually do that. And they, so my takeaway from it was we really need to do a better job of communicating things that we're doing and particularly the things that we do really well, like taking the kid from wherever they're at and addressing every kid as an individual. That is a big uniqueness in our district. And that kind of came out that, hey, we need to treat every kid a little different and not pigeonhole kids. And like, well, if you really knew how hard we work on that, we aren't doing a very good job of communicating. And this survey was open to everybody, whether you had kids in the school or not. So they wouldn't necessarily need to know. Um, but I don't think there was any aha boy we sure missed that kind of thing from the survey um, others that looked at it that's a good summary yeah. Yeah. all right moving on to spring election there's three of us yes so i'll just give a quick overview of the timeline so next week the um election notice will go on the bottom bulletin so then after that, next we need to get our candidates. So Josh, Erica, and Vince, you have paperwork in front of you. So if you're choosing not to run, you'll fill out the declaration of non-candidacy and that deadline is December 22nd. If you're choosing to run, you're gonna fill out the declaration of candidacy and the, de um, the deadline for that is January 2nd. Both um, deadlines are 5 p.m. And then if we get seven or more candidates, we'll have to have a primary election, which is on February 20th. And then the actual election is on April 2nd. Great job remembering all of that. Yeah. <laughs> I think whether you're running or not, put the papers in right away. It tells the yeah. community that, hey, we got a person that's been there. I don't wanna displace them. So I wanna put my name in. If you wait, people start putting their names in because nobody's in. And then if you want it, it's like, oh, if you do, I knew you were doing it, I wouldn't have done it. And so just get your name in either way um, sooner rather than later. Don't wait to the deadline. Yeah. Any questions? Okay, so we can move on to scheduled presentations by guests and staff members. We have the referendum update by Margaret and Johnson. So, Oh, you're still in that booth. It's been since last May. <laughs> Doesn't go quick enough, does it? So nice to see you guys again. I think last time I gave a presentation was early summer. We're good to be back uh, today. Like other formats, I'm going to share a few photos. Construction progress it's come a long way in the last uh, eight, nine months. And then we'll go through schedule updates as well as a budget update. So, uh, and if it were possible, the photo brother would be awesome. With that being said, I believe the drone footage that we put out, um, I sent it to you guys. You guys posted on the website. You want to look at that first? Or um, the picture? Yeah, I think it's, if you guys think it'd be beneficial. I don't we have, we have put it on social media. I'll play this video first. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I got my email then. I think it was in the email, right? Yeah. yeah. That was like this morning at nine, right? So I know Tim and Erica, being at the job meetings, you've had a chance to walk to the building and, and see the progress. Uh, any of you have a little more numbers? Yeah, a little bit. Not yeah. much. Good. Awesome. That being said, if there would ever want to be a scheduled walkthrough, by all means, just let me know and myself or I can walk through. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. There should have been a little music in the, the background. <laughs> yeah, the Synchro Central fight song. <laughs> you can see that Harriet J, that shop additions right there. 
in front of the screen that's coming a long way. Copy, we say both the area J and then that area H, the business lab, those are waterproof now. So the gray roofs are all new construction. That's yep. right here, yeah. J. We want the H right here. Exactly. Yep. With an EPDM style roof. This is going to be the greenhouse right there. All this floor is cemented now because last week it all were but the middle piece, right? Yep, as of yeah. as of this morning, probably about 10 o'clock, all the interior slabs are poured for the work that we're going to accomplish this winter. Then there's some slabs to be poured for the work in the existing school, the remodel <laughs> stuff next summer. I think with uh, with winter right around the corner, being watertight, having the slabs poured, it's gonna it's a good spot to be. The lines were just put on this week for the sure, uh, yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, you see them, they're actually out there painting. This guy right here is driving around. They're painting <laughs> some stuff right there. <laughs> today, right? This morning. Yep. Right. Wrapped up today. <clears throat> Got a little lucky. It's not unusual to have 60 degree days in the middle of November. But not complaining. <laughs> it worked out. That is done. Just the sign. We're just waiting on the sign, right? Yep, so the sign will be installed here any week uh, within the next two weeks, and then the only work left for the stadium would be the bleachers, and it'll happen through the course of the next summer. And the slab's already poured for the visiting side, so it is actually just the bleachers. Mm -hmm. Cool. So Cindy's comment was that she liked that the virtual ed building continued the front. She never mm -hmm. liked that the auditorium Kind of stuck out, yeah. like a, yeah. So she really she commented on that where we had community feedback, like, "Oh, you're going to take away the auditorium as a yeah, no, that, no, I think it which is nice." And then the, kind of the precast or bookends, you know, yeah. auditorium and dogs gym, yeah. and then yeah. new CT edition. I thought that was an interesting comment. You know, not prompted. Yeah, I like it. The parking is wonderful. Separated bus parking. a little lot. Okay, and <laughs> that extra parking in back that's gravelly. Call it Pete's parking lot. It was Pete's idea. Thank you. Okay. And then just a couple of interior photos or still photos. Go through it uh, real quick. So the elementary school, I know that always gets overlooked for us. I know it's exciting what's going on at the high school. I'm looking at a bird dog. Jeremy showed you. And then maybe your intern did put it in music. I don't know. He was trying to get rid of the <laughs> So, the area, uh, the 4K edition at the elementary school, this is the shop from the outside facing towards Central Abner Division, I should say. Uh, the playground was a nice addition, and with that, there's the new port in place, um, play servicing. Really cool addition. I, I just love the feedback from Shelly. I think the kids really enjoy it, and I'm sure uh, I'm sure Greg does as well, just with the maintenance, not cleaning up wood chips, etc. Uh, just the shop from inside. So there's four classrooms based on the floor layout. Layout. So this is just the shot of the. Uh, interstitial space, I'll call it. It's the commons area. So nice cubbies for the kids. Um, some neat little reading nooks. But that was a nice architectural feature that Wold drew in there. And then that's looking back into the existing school. Uh, so here's some before and after shots at the high school. So this was what the parking lot and the field looked like here back in May of this year. And then current today, well, that's a oh. kind of cool to see the transformation. Uh, there's another shot of the parking lot. Well, the first two images didn't really show how much bigger the parking lot got. Like Tim said, it's uh, not even close to that uh, the third auxiliary lot, we'll call it, as far as capacity. So. I don't think you guys have really had an event other than football where 
where the parking has been. Ellsworth kids getting stuck in the. Yeah, that was. That was Amory. Amory. Yeah. Christmas content, you're coming up. Joe. Don't talk about that. So this is a shot before and after. So for the area J, the, the shop classes and the business wings, you can see how those are coming together. Like I said, watertight now, so it's a really good place to be through <clears throat> the winter. Uh, that's another shot of H, the, the business wing from the back of the building there. And then a before and after of the track, which is uh, that's pretty cool to see the transformation. Mm. I think that's all the photos I had today. But again, I, I know I'd love that you guys get a chance to walk through the building. It's always exciting to see the construction. But if there ever wants to be a, a guided tour, just let us know and get that set up and walk and talk. That'd be a lot of fun. Uh, I had put a couple handouts in front of you guys, maybe starting with schedule. Uh, elementary school has been open to be utilized since the uh, fall school year. That uh, sounds it, it's, it's going well. A few odds and ends uh, with some punchless items have been coming up and have been resolved quickly. With being in, in the district working as a high school, I think that's a benefit. Uh, with that being said, just closeouts are being compiled. Uh, commissioning agent Terry Freeze has been engaged. I think he, is, he hasn't yet has sent his final commissioning report in. Uh, so that one is more or less 100% done. I uh, moved to the high school. The schedule they have in front of you is the schedule. Uh, the green line that you see right in the middle of the page is a little vague or a little faint there, but that's where we are today. So going through this high level, if you have specific questions, don't hesitate to ask uh, the parking lot substantially complete there's a little bit of concrete work to do where we butt up to the shop areas but it's it's open it's been being utilized and i think you guys are going in tax as positive uh what's the work glad you guys got to utilize that through this football season again with the striping being completed here just today last thing to focus on will be the new bleachers both visiting and away Right now, we're slating to do that on uh, June 20th through August 1st. So I know we're coordinating with Greg, with Brian Johnson, just to make sure that's a good window. That being said, that's be pretty non intrusive to track. The field should be full use through that process. Uh, moving down, Area H, and Area H is that business wing, so it's off the back of the school. We are enclosed now, so all the brick is on, the exterior facade is on. The rope is on, slabs are poured, so now we're really focusing on interior framing, interior finishes. Projecting out uh, right now, 612, planning on wrapping that up. So, right when the school year is ending, um, then moving down to area J, which would be the shop areas, the wood shop, the metal shop, and then the CTE, the advanced manufacturing area. Uh, in the same respect as area H, we are fully enclosed. The, the roof is on. Slabs are poured. Now we're focusing on interior masonry walls, studs, starting getting into some of the mechanical, electrical, drop ins. Projecting that out, that'll be right towards the, the beginning of June as well. And then as soon as school is out, we will jump in to the existing school where the current shop areas are. We'll be gutting that out, turning that into a uh, fax lab and then the school cafe and the store. So that is a high level review of the schedule. I think we're on track, maybe a little bit ahead of schedule, uh, which is ultimately is a positive. So, any questions on the schedule? All right, let's jump to uh, the overview of the budget. Again, just formatting review. So, starting at the top, we got two columns GMP, that's where we started. Snapshot in time. We started these projects back in May. Uh, projected is our best assumptions if we were to wrap up the project today on where everything would land this year. Uh, so, elementary school, that one is ultimately closed down. You can see the contingency. We were able to utilize all of that. Happy to report that a large majority, 60 to 70%, would be on additions that positively. 
added to the space. So I know we added some parking. Um, there are some fixes to the existing drive in the back. Uh, things of that nature. Some mechanical upgrades for Greg just to help that space function better. What was all the change orders at the high school? Or the majority of it? Material costs or what are we? Um, at the high school, so approved changes, the 70, 746,000. So a lot of those, and if we go to the third page, um, the priority one, two, three, four, five, and six, some of these items I wanted to proceed with. So the main drive entrances, modifying that from the original plan, uh, the PR for the field modification, so I the ticket booth, the archway. Um, some of the, the parking lot, the additional parking lot in the back that's designated as Pete's parking lot. That was taken out of contingency. Uh, that's just a list a few of the big items. And then there are a few other uh, one-off mechanical, electrical change orders that go back to just being able to isolate uh, with the CTE grant and partnering with the college the equipment that they're bringing in, being able to identify what the power requirements are, taking field trips to that college, making slight modifications to breaker sizes, etc. Got it. Um, at the middle school, again, we haven't started yet. Schedule wise on that, 99% of the work is going to happen next summer. The generator that's a part of that project will be installed over Christmas break. So uh, the goal is to have that up online so any IT infrastructure will be generated back up. So if you have any power out of this, that should take the load. Be a nice, nice addition. And then and then the high school. Um, so like I said, the 746,000 that's been put into place already. I think it's a positive. Large majority of that, 70, 80 percent, would be changes that positively increase the scope better the facilities. Uh, the pending review items, uh, items that aren't going forward, just doing preliminary, or I should say internal reviews between the design team, Bold, Olson, Clark, and both of making them ourselves just to vet the number. Uh, but again, those are moving forward. And then pricing, these are 50 to 80% chance of actually happening, but it's projecting out, trying to identify potential costs that we might get hit with with unforeseen. An example would be soil corrections or uh, mechanical electrical clashes, and we're starting to get to that stage of the building. Uh, with that being said, uh, contingency remaining, 91,000. That's assuming that we're using all these pending items. Uh, then if you look at that middle column, $151,000 in contingency remaining, that would be including the middle school contingency. Uh, moving down, professional services, these all have been allocated. Um, a lot of the pre, pre-con items, so the geotechnical report, the survey, uh, the design that Wold and their consultants put into place, they're tracking their costs there. The next page and a half, working with Jen, Tim, uh, we're tracking all the costs that you guys are identifying, whether it's IT, um, so TVs, furniture, cell boosters, et cetera. So tracking that, not only what has been paid today, but projecting that forward. So working with Chad, Jen, on things that you um, know that we need to do, making sure that we're staying within the budget. Uh, and then going to the third page, touching on the uh, wish list items, we'll call them, like I said, items one through six, three at the high school, three at the elementary school. We've already been proceeded with these, these have been taken out of contingency. Uh, now, Seven through 20, few ideas that have been generated uh, from various staff members from Tim and Erica. We're tracking these in the budget as options, being that we are currently tracking under budget. Uh, so maybe if we go down to the, the bottom, the original referendum amount 30 million with Jen's help, the CTE grant that you guys got uh, now at 1.4, almost $1.5 million for the advanced manufacturing space. Uh, interest that you've been gaining on your referendum, we're projecting that to be about uh, 680000 really good win. Terry Freeze has been instrumental in doing focus on energy savings, so working with Excel to fill out the appropriate uh, paperwork to get savings back so you can see how that is being reimbursed. 
33,000. I want to say that's only the middle school. So he's working on the elementary school and he will be working on the high school. So I do believe there's some more money there. And then there's a line item savings for the elementary school. So uh, 50,000 is a close approximation uh, for the self perform work we did. Masonry was most a big contributor to that, but saving $50,000 in that scope of work. So bottom line right now, 143,000 under budget. I think that's a really healthy place to be at this point in the schedule. But I'd like to know that in the wish list column, um, anything listed in that, that is being tracked at the bottom number. So that's a very high level, quick summary, but are there any questions? I'll talk to those specifically. Awesome. Um, so that was my spiel, unless there's any other questions. Thanks for taking the time and helping us with the uh, daycare. Looking at that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That was a nice space. <laughs> it still is. <laughs> I, I want to recognize yeah, Eric and the job he's done and his whole team. Mark and Johnson could not be more pleased. They've gone above and beyond. And uh, uh, Shelly, Pete, Brian, we can all speak to that. They, uh, they, they, they help us out way beyond their scope. Any, any little or big thing we need, they're happy to sit with. They never say, "Oh, that's not in the scope" or anything. You know, it's, yep, you bet. We'll help you out with the lift or the lull, or we'll move that, or we'll, we'll do this, and um, just uh, amazing to work with. So, compliments to you guys, and appreciation. I appreciate that. I'll relay that on to the. Thank you. All right, next up is the 2022-23 DPI score report card, and it's our Director of Teaching and Learning, Ian Hello, everybody. I tried to introduce myself to everyone that was here last month, and it was a little bit more hectic than tonight. <laughs> so um, I think, Jeff, you might have been able to get around to something. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dan Saul. Uh, please call me D. Pete likes to call me Diesel. Um, I feel like this presentation is a little bit full circle tonight. The first time, or one of the first times I actually got to meet the admin team was when I was hired from CESA to come in and do this for them at um, one of their their admin meetings. So it's um, really great to be a part of the team now. So um, this is kind of, I'm not sure where you're at, where you've been in the past in terms of understanding the report cards. So I'm going to go through each of the categories and then I have a slide in here that has a snapshot of each of the schools along with the building. You have the report cards in front of you. The ones that you have are the same ones that anybody in the public can get right now. They came out yesterday, um, along with all of the other state uh, or school and district report cards throughout the state. So that's kind of what I've been digging into the past two days to um, not only prepare for this, but really just to get that information to principals and teachers so that we can move forward with continuing the program. Um, so, and said that before I get started, um, going into the actual data, it's really important to remember that this is not what our school is, where our district is. We're not a score, we're not a number. There's a lot more that comes into play. Um, these were when I Googled St. Croix Central, these were pictures that came up right from the Google images, and it wasn't a score, it wasn't. Um, it exceeds expectations, it meets expectations, doesn't, it was pictures of our kids and our coaches and our staff. And I think that's really important to remember that as we look at these scores, they are important. Absolutely, they are important because we need to look at them and figure out how we can continue to grow and improve, but they're not everything that we are. They are part of the whole child, the whole school, and the whole district. So I just think that's really important to remember as we continue to go on. So the front page, we got a new front page, um, new report card model in general. Of, this is the third year now. Um, I feel privileged in that when we did do the change, I was part of the state accountability team. So we really listened to the voices of the district um, 
the districts throughout the state. And we tried to make something that was um, more user friendly so that instead of just getting it and looking at the state that used to be on the front like this um, with a score and usually colored red, yellow, green, orange that people would look at and then move on and compare. We wanted something that was going to be more focused on everything that's in pages two through 10 versus just that one score on the front. So this forces you to do that. You have to dig in a little bit in order to see what's in it. Um, the very top, there's a narrative statement. That's something that every district can choose on their own. The district that's on, or the, the statement that's on there right now is one that was the same um, the past year. And Tim had asked if we wanted to change that. And it really is kind of our mission and vision wrapped up into a statement on the front. But that was a nice piece that was added for districts to be able to give their own um, personality to the report cards. There's four priority areas. The first one is achievement. Um, this is going to be measuring students' achievement on the tests forward, pre-ACT, and ACT. You may remember the Aspire. That is no longer. Um, it is now the pre-ACT. Um, these are not our scores. So as you're looking at this, these are samples. So I've given this presentation to all three buildings staff. I've also given it to the SCBA um, elementary and high school staff. So in order to be able to effectively and efficiently provide this information, this is just sample um, data here. For the achievement, it's a points-based proficiency. So there's four categories. I'm sure you're very well aware there's below basic, basic, proficient, and advanced. The goal is to get your kids at proficient and advanced. Each category is weighted, and that's up in um, the gray box there. If your student is at proficient, their score is weighted at one, because that's what we want them to be at. If they're in advanced, they get a 1.5. If they're at basic, they get a 0.5. And if they're at below basic, they get zero points. So we earn zero points for that child's test. A lot of the feedback that, um, or criticism that I will get, districts will get, is that this is just one year. It doesn't matter. It's one year. The blue box in the corner is one of the pieces that goes with this and that right there tells you it's minimum. Every, every calculation that is in this report card is a minimum of three years of data, up to five. So that's why, again, it's data, it's one test in each grade level, but it's multiple years. So we really wanna look at that trend data and where our students are performing. Priority area two is growth. And growth is looking at, this one's probably the most confusing, used to be um, value added and there was a lot of very confusing graphs and charts that they had and nobody really understand it, even those of us that dug into it all the time. Um, growth is where a student starts out in third grade and based on their demographics, so their um, ethnicity, their gender, their economically disadvantaged status, whether they're a student with an IEP or not, all of those get compared with all of those other students across the state that are the same as them. Then they're given a predicted score. If they achieve higher than that predicted score, we get a growth score, a positive. If they score lower than that, we get a growth negative score. Again, multiple years, you can see it's weighted from 2021, 21, 22, 22, 23, um, this is the first year where we don't have that gap year of 2020 in there because 1920 we didn't have source. Um, so now we actually have three years that are consistent in there. What would that tell you? Growth. Keep going, sorry. No, that's a good question. Well, what would, what's the point of that? Of like, growth? Of the predict prediction. I mean. Because it lets us know where we want kids to be on the scale score. But how could, that make sense? how could you predict that? Uh, yeah, anyway, sorry, keep nope. going. There's a really light reading. It's about 300 pages from <laughs> yeah. the BARC Center. It's the Value Added Research Center. I just trust that they know what they're doing because I, I do not have a master's in math. 
but I can get it for you if you want to read it. Yeah. Okay. okay. But is it any different? I'm not telling you. Is it any different than we expect a third grader to be reading at this level at the end of the year? Um, we predict where they should be. This puts it all together and compares it across different assessments. So forward to pre-ACT to ACT. And it also compares it um, across the whole state. So we have 1,800, roughly 1,700 students in our district throughout the state, several hundred thousand. So it gives a better statistic as to where they should be versus just our district. Yeah. Good questions. Um, this value added that I was talking about, these individual scores that you're on here, they're really small, but um, you can see that in the sample, most of them are on the left-hand side um, and they're white. It doesn't really matter what those numbers are. Just know that the line in the middle, so this is language arts and math, the line in the middle represents 3.0. The scores can go from zero to 6.0. The state average is always that at 3.0. So when you look at this, ideally, you'd want your scores to be 3.0 or on the right-hand side, right? But what this does is it separates these achievement um, the, or the value added the growth by student groups. So the columns on the left-hand side go through the ethnic groups that you have in your district, economically disadvantaged, students with disabilities or students with IEPs. And then it gives you our English language, and we have 38 students that are not English proficient in our district right now. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, we had 21. So that's becoming a larger population that we want to make sure are being supported. Um, so you want to, again, try to be as close to 3.0 or the other side. These specific scores don't go into our growth score, but they're really, really important when you want to dig into which specific students groups are not growing as fast as the all students category. The third priority area is target group. Target group is the newest one. Um, the target group was changed. It used to be achievement gap. Um, target group was changed because achievement gap was extremely volatile. If you lost a student group one year, you had to have at least 20 students in a group. So think about really small districts. Um, if you lost that student group and you didn't have a score for that category, your score could change by 10, 15, 20 points easily in a year, which is not reflective of your district at all or your school. So our target group is the bottom 25% of students achievement-wise. Every school now has a target group because every student, no matter how high or how low they are achievement-wise, will always have a bottom 25%. And they're always going to want to get those 25% to continue to grow. So that's where the target group comes from. The target group is actually a mini report card for those kids. We got the predicted group for this coming spring and already disseminated that to principals. Their groups are working with those kids to make sure, are they receiving interventions in the specific things that they are um, low in? Teachers are looking at them, their, their progress monitoring. So there's lots of things that, and that was new this year, that target group um, prediction that we got. So they would get their own score and achievement, math, uh, growth, attendance, and chronic absenteeism. The reason, because chronic absenteeism and attendance directly related to achievement, right? Kids need to be in school in order to learn. The difference between chronic absenteeism and attendance, chronic absenteeism is individual. So it's the number of students who miss more than 10% of school. Attendance is all the days of school, all the students and how many days were missed by all of the students. Okay. When you look at notifying or, or looking at student groups, chronic absenteeism is the one you want to look at. Who are those kids that are, you know, gone once a week, late every day, those types of things. And there are um, lots of ways we can dig into that. So it's pretty important. Priority number four is on track to graduation. Um, this one includes chronic absenteeism again, school-wide attendance for all students, not just that body, at bottom 25, and then either um, graduation if you're a high school 
eighth grade mathematics if you're in middle school, and third grade English language arts. Those two English language arts and um, third grade and eighth grade are in there because those statistically research based are the two grades when we know if students are proficient at those particular content areas at that time, they're more likely to graduate. So that's why those are in there. You want those two scores to be really good because if they're not, it can kind of be a double thing because it's also an achievement. So our district data, any questions? That was really quick. No, I totally get it. Perfect. <laughs> report cards um the snapshots that i have for you are this year's and then just a comparison to next year um i certainly can't stand up here and tell you that i have everything figured out these were released october do you remember the exact date tim mm -hmm. it's mid-october um like i said we've done a lot of things already with this data presenting to all the staff and moving forward i'm meeting with plcs starting on friday next week we're obviously off. The week after that, I'm going into all in middle school. And then I have three high school um, PLCs that already contacted me with wanting more data. So that's exactly what you want. We want people looking at this. Um, so this year and last year, if there's a, a blue there, I tried to give you the, the pluses. Um, I really like to look at the celebration. So, so at the elementary level, awesome, going up 70 point, going up 2.6 to 70.6. Um, that was a really, when I presented to the elementary, they were ecstatic. They have been working so hard on so many different pieces of the curriculum down there that to finally be able to see a little bit of a jump was really something that they needed. Um, piloting bridges right now, along with math expressions, we've got three different supplemental pieces that we're doing with our units of study. Um, it's just, they were, they were just really excited. It was a great meeting. Um, some celebrations, growth stores are significantly higher in both ELA and math. Um, lots of room to keep going, but um, increase in ELA math performance and proficient and advanced also for three years run. So it's on the trend to keep getting better. Okay. Questions on that? Maybe we just want yeah. on the, the growth subject. Is the goal to have that be 100? which means that there's no no you can grow so that's a, a misconception is oh well what if we have 99 percent growth we don't have room to grow you do have room to grow and again that's in that math but they have I'm assured yes that, that, that there yeah. is room to grow okay. yeah okay. yeah i believe for growth the average um the state is set at 66 always. I would have to find that exactly. I think it's 66. And as I recall, the elementary is K4, even though grade schoolers are fifth, five, and six, but we have them in our middle school. We so if, if the elementary school ours is K4, they're compared against all K5 buildings. Mm -hmm. So they used to do it separately into every different entity that was possible and we can imagine one you have a smaller population so you don't have as consistent of data so they ended up going k5 k8 612 68 or 912 so that's it if you're a 712 building you're you're with 612 if you're a k4 you're with k5 yeah so it makes one grade more impactful um it can so ours is third and fourth grade the growth score you're absolutely right we only get one year bless you we get one year of growth that can be really beneficial um there's some schools near us that are very similar to us and one of their elementary schools is consistently high every single year and they have one year so that's where that third grade and everything that happens before third grade, right? I mean, it right. doesn't just happen in third grade, but yeah, absolutely. Just like our middle school. Yeah. Right. So if things are going well, they have a better chance. Yeah. yeah. Middle school, very similar to last year, 79.7. Um, our middle school was in the top five at CESA 11. That's 79.7. 
um, with all of the data that I went through yesterday and today, very few district, no district, no district scores at 80 or above. Two years ago, there were like three. There's none in our seats 11 out of 39 districts. Um, high school, there were no high school. Middle school, I think there might have been one. Um, elementary, there were a couple. But it's statewide. They're just, they're not where they used to be. They're just not. Maybe you don't have the answer to that, but why? Tim asked me that this morning when I he came through too. Um, I, I can't give you a research-based answer, um, but I think there's just a lot of changes with families and priorities and um, sitting down at the dinner table and doing homework and everybody's busy and um, we expect our teachers to do a lot and our parents to do a lot and kindergarten isn't what it was 25 years ago. A lot of things have changed. So it's a lot. Um, and on top of the achievement, social emotional learning, all of those things are, are put in there. So it's um, we're asking everybody to do a lot. So thanks. Are we, are we kind of too just starting to see some of the data roll in from kids kind of being in and out of school for a couple of years. COVID? Yeah. Oh, I, I don't think that's gone as I get any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. as far as in your numbers as a kid. Yes. Think about, so the kids that tested last year in third grade would have been the year. That was their first school year. So they would have been 4K. Yeah. 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 So I know I had three kids at home at that point during, during virtual. Awesome. I don't know how great mine was. Yeah. And mine were in high school middle school it was really difficult and everybody did the best they could mm -hmm. so yeah there's that there's that for sure and i don't think that that's going to go anyway go away anytime soon but it also can't be our crutch yeah. it can't be our excuse because everybody did the same thing everybody had the same thing so high school um 64.2 down 9.2 this year um this is the one that i've been trying to dig into the most um, because it was the most significant change. Um, and this was where I went to look at scores of all of the districts in CESA 11. And um, district-wide, 39 districts, seven went up this year, only seven. 32 went down. Um, high schools, um, I want to say the highest was 75.6, 75.6. So that's significantly different than a couple of years ago. I believe it was like 80 for me. That's eight points difference. And it probably wasn't the same school. There is fluctuation in these. And I know um, there's a few schools, are, we are one of them, that tends to stay near the top year after year. Um, there are some that are near the top one year and then they go to the middle of the pack the next year where we have that consistency. Um, with all of the scores that I looked at, there was one school that had mid 70s at all three buildings. And they're not at the top. They're not in the, I want to say they maybe were in the top 10. Um, and that was Spring Valley. Consistent all the way. Everything else maybe too high, one low, and some were really low. Um, you know, um, Elmwood just came out with theirs, um, their number one this year in, in the CESA 11, their high school and their middle school, pretty high scores, their elementary was very low. So you have to just take the data, use it to what's going to move the school forward. And I think Mr. Newsbaum's presentation right after this will be one of those things that hopefully will be a, a positive strategy. So um, last one is um, St. Croix Virtual Academy. So 55.5. And this was another great meeting. Um, so I looked back three years ago, they had a 43. So they've jumped this much in three years. Um, it is so 
difficult. We have 86% enrollment right now, open enrollment, excuse me, at the virtual academy. All of these, these kids, the amount of time it takes to get these kids to show up at testing sites to go, and they have almost 100%. Um, we started our testing, state testing meeting um, two weeks ago, or excuse me, um, a month and a half ago. And Carly Exton, that is the, the counselor there. And they have, and Steph Colsa, they have the dates all set up for Waukesha and Appleton and Spooner so that these kids can get in. They're really, really working very hard to make sure those kids are engaged, showing up, passing classes, and graduating. So... A lot of improvement there. One of the things that they asked for was they want comparisons to other virtual schools that are the same size as them. And then what programs are they using? What things are they doing? So that's on my um, to-do list. So. And then here is our district overall. And I have some comparisons on the last slide, but I'll let you just take a, take a look at this. Um, overall, still... Um, very high achieving district. So you want to explain the, the virtual school and its impact on our district score? Yeah, absolutely. So anytime you have a school that has more than 50% of its enrollment from open enrollment, it does not count towards your district. So our virtual school does not count towards this particular score. Um, What's your threshold? 50%. And we're at 86. We're at 86. Of the virtual school enrollment. Of the, okay. of the kids enrolled, uh, over 50% are... 86% are come from outside, outside of St. Craig Central School District. So we don't care as much as we can educate those kids. We care a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we don't count them in our grade, so we must not care. <laughs> uh, because in IDEA and the ESSA report, if we don't have any 95%, we get docked. Yeah. That's the decision. Um, My yeah. guess is the kid in the virtual school, the teachers and People that are working with them have no idea whether they're in or out of the district. It doesn't probably not. matter. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. See what who does and who doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so does that answer the question? I don't know. Um, so just a couple of comparisons. And I, I think, you know, to be aware is good. But again, apples and oranges. But still... Um, good information to just take in. So we are fifth out of the 39 CISA 11 districts. Um, and this is just based on district score, not any of the individual schools. Third out of the eight middle border, fourth out of the 13 benchmark CISA 11 school districts. Um, 69 out of 379, 4K12. There's 420-some actual districts in the state, but this is just the 4K-12 ones. I thought it was a little bit more relevant. Um, eight out of 45 for school districts with similar size and demographics. So our enrollment um, was 1695, I believe, on this report card, and 1635. Um, so this is districts between 1200 and 1900. Um, our economically, at ECD stands for economically disadvantaged, so roughly um, 19.6 students that are receiving for your reduced lunch. Um, SWD stands for students with disabilities. We are at 13.8%, which is very average um, around the state. I believe the state average is 14%. Um, and economically disadvantaged, we're on the low end. So more of our report card is on achievement than it is on growth. Um, I think the one that's the highest last time I checked was Spooner and it had 70%. Um, EL, English language learners, so students who are not English proficient, is 1.9 percent. Like I said, we have 37. That is not that that number. And then open enrollment, OE, is 8.1 percent. And if we exclude virtual school, does this also no. exclude? No, no, they're not included in this at all. Not the other thing to note is this is only all academic year students. So it, they have to be on the third Friday of September 
and they have to be here through the testing window. So if a student moves in, they still test, they, we still get their data, we still put it into our, our cumulative data, but they do not count on their report card. Because it wouldn't be representative of what they were thinking. Um, next steps, really, we're going to continue celebrating. I mentioned a few of the things, but we're going to focus on what's best for kids and stick to our four priorities. Um, and uh, really, this working, I, I try to be in the buildings as much as I can, and it's been wonderful um, getting into, like I said, the PLCs and having people reach out. So, um, got lots of work. We're doing it. So. I'm, I'm sure this is a four hour answer in 30 seconds. So what, 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 do, what are kind of the main things that you do with this data that we get? I mean, is it, does it lead to kind of, it could lead to performance of, of teachers or certain curriculum adjustments? Absolutely. Yeah. All of the above. All of the above. So um, one of the things that typically happens in the summer, but we're going to start doing little pieces of it throughout the year. Like when I go into the PLCs, um, I'll bring data and then um, hopefully they can pinpoint because I want them to really be guiding the conversation um, versus me just saying, here's all the data and then saying, this is what it means. We want everybody to have ownership and voice. So um, looking at the data and digging down to content, grade level, subgroups. So all of those categories, the students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged, um, um, English language, boy, girl, trend data. How is fourth grade performing on ELA research year after year after year? If it's mm -hmm. something that they're at below basic on 80% of them are here, that's an issue. That's a tier one issue. So we're going to look at that. Um, yes, absolutely. With resources, curriculum, looking at all of that. So that would be the root cause of the why. But there's a lot of conversation that comes before you get to that, um, that why. Thanks. So when you look at that, third grade was below Forward, what yep. we expected. Um, is that how they taught? Is it the dynamics of that particular cohort that came in? I mean, yeah. whether it's right or wrong, every class kind of gets a label that this they is do. a tough one, this yeah. is a smart one, whatever. Yeah. So does our research figure out, well, we did something wrong teaching or here's what we can do better? We try to, and I, I would say it's adult reflection. So what can we do better? Um, but the doc that I'm working on right now to go into the third and fourth grade on Friday is exactly what you said. So it shows um, the third grade in 2019, third grade in 2020, 2021, 22, 23. So you can see that the third grade, yeah. what's happening in third grade, but then there's another one that watches that cohort of students from the time they're in third grade all the way to their ACT. So you can do both. Yeah. Yeah, we have more, it happens. used to be when my kids graduated, pretty much the graduating class were K through 12 together. Now we have kids coming in. So the third grade cohort, when they're in sixth grade is maybe 70 or 80 percent of what the third grade was mm -hmm. three years ago mm -hmm. so that i think yeah. messes some of that continuity growth stuff and the nice thing with all of our data warehouses now you each kid is tracked individually too. all of that's right in there so you can see they're projected you can see where they actually are it's pretty um advanced. what projects at a computer I'm still stuck. <laughs> <laughs> what, question? what projects the equation? The equation. Yeah. Um, you talking about the portal? Like Edge Climber would be one. Why is dash for districts? Why is dash? So here's here's your assignment. Here. You're gonna go home. You're gonna look up why is dash public because anybody can get into that. And you can go in and you can, there's some toggles, and that's what you can see. Except when we go in, we can see student names. Huh. You can't get in to see student names. But that's what. That's how it'll look. Why is dash? Yep, why is dash public? Not why that why is ass. I can't wait. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Lots more to do, but yeah. Yeah, I mean you. on two days yeah. notices. Yeah. Really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Dee.
All right. Here we are. Um, 8C presentation regarding switching from semesters to trimesters at the high school. The high school principal, Pete Newsbaum. Welcome, Pete. Yeah, welcome. So, um, Dee, thank you. That's incredible. Dee has been doing an amazing job for us. Um, so she's got her. Um, and and she's, she's right on. So since we've got these scores, just give you an idea, um, we have our late start Wednesdays. And um, each Wednesday, there's a piece of each PLC, uh, we call them collaborative teams now, where there's a component where they should be looking at ECT and breaking some of that down. Um, and not to highlight it, but just one of the things we're looking at is we had a five-year downward, downward trend with our math. So, you know, rethinking some of that um, in regards to what we're doing, how we're doing it. So, but at the same time, I think everybody around here knows that we're not looking for excuses, but, you know, high school's had some change. Um, but the other thing, I think every school, what do you guys ask what's going on? Chronic absenteeism is a huge problem throughout the, the state right now. Um, every district is struggling with it. And as um, Dee mentioned, that's a big part of the town now is part of the report card. So, and the rules change. The rules change statewide in regards to how that the score is configured. So, uh, when that, when the, you change the rules, you know, it's a little bit different. So, but we're working really hard. And, uh, but I know it's getting late, so I'm going to get all in here. So, trimesters, um, to be honest with you, when this year started, I had no clue I'd be here presenting on this. This is 100% um, the process of empowerment in our guiding coalition leadership team. They started this um, about five years ago with Mr. Soderberg looking at this and it just kind of stalled. Um, and in one of our first leadership meetings of the year, um, somebody asked to bring it back up. So, what is a trimester schedule? And I know you looked through some of this, um, but it's basically, you know, try is three. So it's basically, right now we're in a 36 week schedule broken into two semesters. Trimesters is breaking into 312. Um, currently, right now, um, our year long classes will run um, two trimesters. If we, if we go to trimesters, uh, most of the AP college classes will typically run all three. Um, semester long electives um, will um, fluctuate between two, and now we have the luxury of adding 12 week electives, which in the CTE area and, and some of the, the business ed notes, we can get really creative. Um, matter of fact, there's even um, some of the, the core areas in some of the schools we talked to have um, shared some of the neat things that they've created in a 12 week trimester class. So, so basically, um, what we're looking at is going from a two, two trimester 18 weeks to three 12 weeks. This is this slide, um, the next one, if you went to, um, not going to go through it. I put it there just kind of for you to look at the history of why this started, when it started. So I'm not going to go through this and I'm jump right back in, right into benefits. So the why, um, you know, we always talk about kids first, students first. So I have two slides here. Number one, this is um, pretty much been the main focus of why trimesters brought up. The, the teachers want more time. So it provides more time for students to learn, demonstrate proficiency with, within a grading period. Um, Longer class breaks more time. One of the things that we've worked on extensively at the high school this year, and I know we do it at all the buildings, is really working on that, that better teacher-student relationship. With fewer classes in age, it will give them more time to um, work with kids independently and um, maybe offer some more of a workshop model but uh, we feel we'll have a huge benefit on um, their relationship building with kids and teachers. 
um, it will allow students to take a wider variety of classes. Right now, our, our freshmen can take one elective per semester. That's it, two electives. And it really kind of pigeonholes our schedule. So with, with the adoption of going trimesters, we're gonna hopefully be able to add anywhere from five to six more electives for, for freshmen. So it's gonna open up electives um, throughout. And the, one of the big parts is that the in-depth learning. You know, we have more time in it. You go from a 42, 45 minute period to 65. Now you're gonna have a teacher be able to go deeper. And, you know, our, our goal is not to have, because we go 65 minutes, now we teach like we used to, and now we take the last part and use it for homework. That's not our goal. Our goal is for to be consistent peer one to instruction um, and not, not given time for homework, but allow them to go deeper um, and uh, a little bit more exploration. You think of a, a science teacher today, uh, we'll use one of Mr. Johnson's favorite units of rocks. You know, if you're going to explore rocks and you have 42 minutes, by the time you get done with all your pre classroom stuff, you have 15 minutes of exploration, and then it's clean up time. So, a better example uh, Courtney Hawkins making bread. Uh, the other day, they were making bread. They had to take their bread dough, make their bread dough, then that's all they had time for because they didn't have time to cook the bread dough. So, they had to let the bread dough sit in the fridge overnight. Then they come back the next day and make their bread dough. You know, so the planning time and the prep time of even baking bread, you can't get it done in 45 minutes. Um, and the, the models we're looking at, people showing a second, we're looking at anywhere from 65 to 70 minute classes, um, five periods a day rather than the eight shorter ones. Um, so continue that a little bit. That also, in my mind, because we have multiple strategy, multiple to make students learn, having more time will allow teachers i think to vary their strategies you know um, using different ways to, to teach rather than the typical get up in front lecture wrap up send them out um, so uh, hopefully we will see more project-based type things um, more hands-on experiences um, and i think that will only only help is we have the different, many different learning styles. The additional trimester can be used for remedial course or extra support. So for example, a majority of the schools and to give you an idea, um, I think four elementary board of schools have transitioned to this. Osceola has been doing it for five years and they're, they are a school we've been collaborating with most. They will use, if let's say for instance, I take algebra, a, and I take algebra A first trimester, second trimester, and then typically I'm done. Well, let's say I'm struggling. Now, rather than have a student take an elective in that third trimester, they roll into an extension, algebra extension, and those kids then get one extra trimester of algebra. And the schools are seen, Oculus uh, got the, the best score right now in the middle border and um, they utilize it. So I think that would really help with that growth component that we're looking at in our report card score. Um, basically a number, a, kind of a double dose. And you know, when you think of workload, um, it, it's gonna reduce the workload when uh, Tracy Crawley during some semesters, whether it's this semester or next or she might have five different preps because she's teaching five different classes. That's a pretty hefty workload. So I think, you know, with um, typically they'll be teaching four class periods rather than seven. That's a that's a less of a workload. And I think that, that helps in regards to students being or teachers being able to sit down, take a breath, go to the bathroom, um, you name it. And I think that it might take a little bit of that overwhelming feeling that they have. Um, you know, I don't have a drawback um, for students here. And, um, you know, as we've had conversations, Mr. Conway's been part of them. You know, probably the biggest concern we have with this is the kids that can't 
maybe set for 65 minutes, 70 minutes. And we're looking at that. And even right now, to be honest with you folks, there's kids even 45 minutes can't sit still. And those kids are allowed to go take a walk. Those kids are allowed well, to I was go. Gonna, I don't know if there's. They're allowed to be able to stand in the back of the little. You can't room. make it 45, 65 isn't going to be a big difference. No. So, so but <laughs> I don't we're already parents. making adaptations for those kids anyways. Um, so, so that I, I didn't figure we'd need a slide for that, but I do did want to address that. It's not all benefits in, in regards to what we're looking at. Um, so benefits for teachers. Um, these are things that we, we talked about. Focus teaching. You know, they're focused on fewer, fewer subjects each trimester. They can go in deep in, in more depth. Uh, more flexibility um, for them to pace their curriculum. Obviously, that first year and every year, hopefully, we'll be improving and enhancing it. Um, the, the increased professional development. I mean, the prep's going to go from 42 minutes to 65. And our hope is that if um, it is increased planning, increased preparation, um, you name it. So um, we've already talked about the improved student teacher relationships. That benefits the teachers also. Um, improved teacher parent relationships. Can give teachers more time because they have 20 more minutes per day. Hopefully, um, you know, we encourage them to make calls. Don't send emails. Um, hopefully, um, this would help improve our, our parent teacher relationships in regards to making contacts. So um, next one benefits for men. I, I don't know. I just kind of looked at this in regards to resources. Um, because you have less classes and you might not have to buy 100 textbooks, you might be able to get by with 60. Um, so it might be, um, there should be a benefit on resources. Um, easier scheduling. Um, this going to trimester is going to um, help us um, with flexibility. For example, um, just this couple of weeks ago, I wanted to, we wanted to move a kid into a math extension and we started looking at schedule and um i couldn't make the move because there was no um, um english lit in the first period or second period and so you know now we're we're trying to do some interventions outside of that time frame so there might be a situation where we put them in the extension that first trimester and then they start with algebra a a second trimester and going third so we'll give us some flexibility um, I I put this in there, you know. Um, I um, I know when I was at St. Croix Falls and we went from block where we had three transitions during the day and went to an eight period day, and all of a sudden you have kids traveling three more times during the day. That's three more times the kids are going to be tardy. Three more times the kids are going to have unstructured time. Um, so I think that will benefit us, even though we don't deal with a whole lot right now. Um, and I don't want that to appear that it is because I put there, but it is, there's less travel time, less less um, transitions. So it, it will benefit in regards to the parties and, and getting kids where they need to be. And I'm cruising. Um, so if you guys need me to stop or have a question, um, let me know, please. So this, um, I cannot take credit for this. I put the John Tappan and Mitch Clinic, when they started this work five years ago, um, when they, they started talking about what would be the benefit, you can see the addition of, of minutes and, and the difference in regards to, um, so when you look at the total for trimester minutes of instruction at 11,180 compared to their minutes of 7,740, um, that's a that's a pretty big problem. Now the key is, um, and we'll get to it later, is that how we utilize that time. You know, um, that's a big part of that. So I want to include that, but uh, John and Mitch did a nice job of breaking this down um, and uh, digging into what would be the event change because I think obviously that would and should be a big question anybody that's in wants to look at why we're doing this 
I think it's a huge benefit. Uh, moving to the next one then. So Mr. Johnson and I have put together four different schedules that um, there we're looking at. I just put the first one that we that um, I developed. Brian has access to the four. We can share those with you guys if you want. Um, but just I just want to give you an idea of what a day would look like. So if uh, you look at period one, um, we're kind of going with 65 minute periods. Um, because we only have one serving line, we cannot go with just two lunch periods. Um, if we had a double serving lines, we could, but we just couldn't get the kids through. So the minimum, we have to go with three lunch periods. So when you look at three, that period three, that is basically a lunch and class split up in, in a trifecta. Um, so um, when you look at three A, B, and C, it's a little complicated, but if you look, there's three lunch periods built in there and, and there'll be three different classes built within there. Um, and then period four, period five. Um, and, and B class um, is split. And that was something we were a little nervous about, but when we brought it to our guiding coalition and to our staff, there were several teachers that said they would, they would prefer to teach a class in that split period. So they would, you know, the they would start class, they would go for 25 to 30 minutes, then the kids would go to lunch, and then they would come back to that same class, and it would end in 25 or 35 minutes. Um, and it, it surprised us that we had so many teachers big surprise. that said this would work really well for how I teach and what I would like to do in my class. And so that will help us a little bit with some of the scheduling is having the, the staff that's willing to teach in kind of non-traditional you know period so what we would do is when we when we build the schedules let's say let's say for example seven of the 36 teachers said i would prefer to teach that we could hand schedule those classes within there before we build the schedule and they would they would be in that that time period now the one thing that, that um when you look at this the four different ones um, i want to be very transparent in the conversations that are taking place at the high school you can see here the when what I need our intervention periods is period two. Um, there's a large part of the staff that want that win period at the end of the day. Um, and um, they see benefits there. There's um, there's a large part of the staff that want that win right before lunch period. Um, and um, as Mr. Conway sitting behind us, there's also um, a schedule built that that has music right in the middle and everything in the mix and then what that creates is a 30 minute lunch study hall um which um right now is is kind of what we have now where kids eat and when they don't they go sit in a basically unstructured 30 minute study hall and i have to be honest and transparent it's unstructured basically um i'm just kind of hanging out so um but we have four right now um and we we have sent it out and uh, had staff kind of look through it and complete a survey um but i just wanted to give you just a sample um so moving on then um with what we did um there's a guy by the name of mark westover he calls himself the expert the trimester expert, and um, he's a pretty um, generous individual because um, he said, "Be send me your semester, send me your schedule right now, your matrix, and I will put it in a trimester format." So obviously, what you're going to see here, there might be classes that are just two trimesters that we might make three, but I wanted you guys and the staff to be able to see what it what it might look like so this is going to be way too much for me to try to explain right now but this would be what a master schedule would look like for every teacher um and if you wanted to compare i could send you our master master schedule with the semesters um but mark westerberg did this for nothing um and uh 
He's also, um, we dialogue back and forth um, about questions that the staff has, and he's very forthcoming with information. So, um, very, very um, um, good resource for us. So, moving on now. Concerns, workthroughs, things that um, we feel that we really need to hammer out um, if if we move forward with this is that transition process from semesters, all that works for kids and staff. Um, making multiple band and choir classes work within that framework. Um, because you know, when you whenever you make a schedule, you have winners and losers. Even if we were going to a block schedule or a modified block, there's winners and losers. Um, and we want to try to reduce as many of the losers as possible. Um, Shared staff with the middle school. Um, that, I think that's going to be a barrier that we really have to work, work through a chance and be very intentional. When placement in the schedule, we have a lot of different um, uh, perceptions in grants where it should be. Um, where is it now? In the morning? It's in the morning. Second block. Yeah. Or hour. Right, right after second, second hour. Yeah. Yep. Okay. You know, and any of the intervention experts, and I'm going to, again, in full transparency, my biggest struggle is that for years, I worked with the RTI Center out of Monroe and Madison, and uh, I've done a lot of research with Wynn, and any expert Wynn will tell you if you put Wynn at the end of the day, just get rid of it because it's not worth it. They've already checked out. Yeah. yeah. It's so, not yet to have that at the So end of the day. it's, it's, it's a big struggle for me, but the benefit is, of course, you have, you have kids leaving, they're not leaving core classes when they leave for sports and so forth. So the, I, I, I am internally struggling with, um, and I want to make sure it's not about me, and that at the end of the day, the conversation is what's best for kids. But uh, so um, we're having the conversation about that win placing, placement. And I think the most important thing for Brian and I to consider and um, staff to consider is if we make this move, um, if moving from teaching 45 minutes to 65 minutes does not come natural. Um, we need to be relentless in our PD and our process of how we bring the teachers along um, and the impact of this teaching strategies, hopefully, and full utilization of that time. Because you can see there's a, a big change of minutes but not if we don't utilize those um, in, with that. But I think in the end, it's a flexible, very flexible system. I think when we think about our report card score, I think the time is absolutely 100% right. Um, and, um, you know, usually when, when you look to make a change like this, it usually comes from the top down. This isn't coming from the top down. This is coming from the role players. Um, so I, I, I would love um, to move forward after tonight and give me this information um, to um, move forward with the, the next steps, which is the transition plan. Um, and that is, um, um, if you could move to, there you go. Um, we're working with staff already. Um, they're creating classes, one trimester classes, two trimesters are highlighting whether they need three for like their college classes and their um, CAT classes. Um, we have, I talked about, for example, schedules. Um, Brian and I will be working with staff in how we choose that. And um, again, the, the biggest com component, and I know there might be a situation where 75% of the staff want the schedule, um, but I need to verify and verify and re-verify that whatever schedule we do is what's best for kids, all the kids. Um, and the next the next part is communication to parents and students regarding the change. I think the parents have already heard about it because I've already had 150 kids come and ask me about why we're going trimesters. So um, we have people having those conversations. Um, but uh, you know, time is of the essence because communicating this to the families, the kids, and then having it ready for um, 
the um, scheduling process. I have worked with Ms. Dino, probably the most critical component of this because she's the one that builds our schedule. And she's already had um, two learning sessions with CISA and um, is collaborating also with um, with Osceola and, and building, building the schedule. So the other thing that we really need to consider, and I have the policy up there, and that is the, the graduation credit um, requirements, which is in that policy. Um, right now, we have 24, and we think that we're going to be moving from possibly offering 12 credit or 12 classes to 15 possibly for a year we we feel that we need to up the credit requirements and we're on, our goal is to not up the credit required credits in core but in the electives so if you look on the bottom there our goal is to next year in the class uh, we'll still stick with 24 and then we go up by half credit increments and the front current freshman class would or the incoming freshman class would be expected then to have 25.5 credits required to graduate so and we would need that blessing but that would be a policy we have to um get rolling on if if we move from there so with that being said the next part is thanks for taking your time i know this is your third presentation tonight and that's a lot for one night um but uh, questions how come you didn't want win after lunch well so if let's say you're in that last lunch right uh -huh. and then and then you have win and then all of a sudden now you've got a let's say you're not in an intervention now you've got 75 80 minutes of unstructured time and right after all? lunch also puts pushes the first lunch really early okay um and so that's the part where you also try to be really cognizant of, you know, having your first lunch. What would it take to make two lines in the cafeteria? Oh, a whole reconfiguration and gutting of the kitchen. Oh, should ask the community about that. <laughs> we could have an electricity. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's interesting how we did all this analysis of building and use and I never heard a two-line lunch would be beneficial I mean we had lots of opportunities that we maybe could have stuck that in and it just didn't go up but you know this is the when you do stuff like that you start stressing existing systems right so, right and what Brian's talking about so we we when we when we even think of putting when one of the uh, schedules they um want to look at was when right before lunch well if our one is 45 minutes and then a 40 minute lunch it's 85 minutes you know if if you're in that so and it pushes the last kids to eat at 12 45 and finish at like 118 but they're gonna be so hungry kids have you discussed the possibility of two lives sammy because webster had hot wells they just rolled out yeah, so and made two lines on. Well, I mean, it wouldn't be a recon. I mean, it would just be I'm getting going going equipment. equipment, you know, just yeah. some trades that roll out. Yeah. I mean, what I, I guess we, we could talk to her and look at the space, but, you know, I always think of when you double lines and you double your personnel also. You know. Well, that's the question to ask her. Yeah. I oh, wouldn't think to make it self serve. But. Yeah. I mean, I can, I, I can, we can definitely address that for sure as we, I think if the time is right right now, I mean, we're going to do it. Let's have that conversation. That's not the major issue. But no, I have not. Is the teacher, a lot of the teachers on board with this? I mean, is it a pretty overwhelming? This was so, it, it was, it, like I said, it was really weird for me that this came up because it wasn't something I had expected. Um, this, this was definitely teacher driven. Um, and when we had the staff meeting, I was still kind of be on around a little bit in regards to it. And, and the meeting, I was getting the sense that, okay, I think you guys just want me to make a decision. And um, when when we did a, a poll, I would say, um, I asked 
because I know some were very uncomfortable about like raising the hand. So we just did the, the thumb close to the heart. And um, I had two to the side. I had four down and the rest were out out of about 38. So it was a it was a vast majority. That's good. Again, just, you know, if you look through this, um, shoot some emails, questions that you might have. So um, with that being said, um, I guess I'm looking for a blessing to move forward with this. And then the next thing is, I'll, I, the next steps is you see transitions. I'll put together a, a parent letter of communication, start working with Sandy, and, and then we'll have to probably look at that policy. I had Perfect. trimesters at Iowa State when I was there. They've switched, since switched to semesters, but having three things, I mean, it, the semester of physics is a long freaking time. If you can get it to 12 weeks instead of 18 weeks, and sure you're going into physics too the next semester, but it's a fresh start, you get to start over. I like the three instead of two yeah and the teachers that we talked to the scone day lance and i were there some of the teachers said you know then they were saying that they only have to plan for six classes right so they're more focused on those as well as our students are focused only on six classes instead of eight and i think that that's a great benefit as well i remember when we went from half day to all day kindergarten they were like, hey, we're not going to teach them twice as much. We're just going to teach them the stuff we're teaching a lot better and have more time. And I suspect that in what we taught in 45 minutes, we're not going to teach 30% more in an hour. We're just no. going to spend more time on the 45 yeah. minutes to get it driven down and get accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No. No, it's not a board action. There's no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, team. That's good work. Yeah, thank you. All right. Oh, so, <laughs> moving on to financial reports, Derek said that he would do that I'm for us. Gladly thank read you. that. I just read the top. The bottom, the right? I think it's the bottom. What oh, is the bottom? Yeah, bottom. Yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. All right, bank account balances as of 10-31-23. Citizen State, ba Citizen State Bank checking $3,801,183.29. Uh, Citizen State Bank money market $1,081,924.05. Citizen State Fund 46, $55.65. Uh, Citizen State money, money market suicide prevention $4,779.71. American Deposit Management Debt Service, $162,426.19. American Deposit Management Referendum, $10,918,667.73. American Deposit Management Referendum, $3,607,242.29. American Deposit Management Debt Service, $147,023.68. Local Government, uh i don't know what isv stands for okay cool zero dollars total bank account balances of 19 million seven hundred twenty three thousand three hundred two dollars and fifty nine cents thank you cool. yeah. jeff made the motion they have second any discussion all in favor aye. 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 opposed motion carries Moving on to consideration of consent agenda. We have 16 part-time and one full-time particular modification request to enroll in on uh, virtual courses for the 23-24 year. Is that really Greg Green? Yeah, it's really Greg Green. I saw that. Yeah. I was pretty surprised. April 1st, though. Correct. Yeah. How come? 
but just trying to give notice and then so we can post it and then have some transition time with the new hire three or four it. months uh working with them the legend <laughs> And it makes it easy. We could have, we could have our thing be April second. Yeah. <laughs> no, I get it. Yeah. All right. So we need a motion to approve <laughs> the consent agenda. Anybody want to make a motion? So move. Second. All right. So Jeff made the motion. Dave second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. Motion carries. Moving on to administrative reports, student enrollment update. Hi, Tim. Uh, students in seats, 1,603. Free and reduced lunch rates, uh, 24.99%. Um, big highlights, the bottom right, I want to point out, we're at 264 in our virtual charter school as compared to 229 in November of last year, so it's up 35 kids. Uh, really po uh, trending positively. And then, which contributes to our open enrollment number, which is amazing. You look at last year, it was 263 in, 137 out for a difference of 126. This year, 402 in, 120 out, difference of 282. So that's very strong. Um, our open enrollment certainly uh, makes up for our slightly declining enrollment in the early grades. Thank you. Moving on to the key work of our school board, student, staff, and community recognition. Josh? Yeah. <clears throat> we got a list tonight. So <laughs> buckle up. Lucas Spitzmuller. Uh, Lucas, congrats on your second team selection to the NBC All Conference soccer team. Braden Rasmussen. Congratulations on earning second team honors on the NBC Boys Cross Country team. Emma Lamers, Brooke Nally, Addie Swanson. Emma Brooke and Addie, congrats on earning NBC second team all conference honors for the girls cross country team. Lily Klinkhammer, Lily, congrats on winning the NBC cross country title and selection as first team all conference runner. Well done. Jalen Hinsman, Jalen, congrats on your selection as a first team member of the NBC all conference volleyball team. Chloe Peterson, Morgan Barker, congrats, Chloe and Morgan, on your second team selection to the NBC All Conference Volleyball Team. Also, Rubis, also congrats on your honorable mention selection to the NBC All Conference Volleyball Team. Peyton Murph, Peyton, congrats on your selection as the award winner for the spirit of the NBC from the volleyball coaches. Brody Pizig, Riley, Riley Drinkwine, Red Schweitzer, Noah Nussbaum, Mason Sullivan. Congratulations on your selection as first team members to the defensive middle border all-conference football team. Tad Posey, Brody Pizig, Levi Mahidi, Noah Nussbaum, Sam Fisher, Mason Sullivan, Max Waters. Congratulations on your selection as first team members on the offensive middle border all-conference football team. Uh, Eli Poneth, Sam Fisher, Caden Wester, congrats on your selection as honorable mention members on the NBC football all-conference team. Uh, Rhett Schweitzer, Brody Pizig, Mason Sullivan, Sam Fisher, Noah Nussbaum, congratulations on being selected by the WFCA as all region football players. John Hugh, thank you for sharing, uh, for chairing this special meeting of district electors. Your leadership is greatly appreciated. You continue to serve our school community in many ways, including as the voice of the Panthers. You are appreciated. Uh, we have a few here. I'm just going to list all their names and then I'll, I'll read the recognition. Caitlin uh, Thurlmeyer, David Linsmeyer, uh, Alyssa Fritchie, Chris Jardine, Travis Madigan, Aaron Pop, Becca Paulson, Jenna Scheidauer, uh, Michael Becker, Carly Eichstead. Amy Von Van uh, Grinsman. Uh, so all of you that we listed, thank you for serving our students and staff and supporting them the last few work weeks during the many tragedies. We are blessed to have you on our team. You are appreciated. So thank you to all those for that. Noah Nussbaum, uh, Noah, congrats on your selection as honorable mention uh, member on the WFCA All-State football team. Emery Sanders, uh, Brianna, Poppenhagen, Izzy Sabelko, Lucy Manzel, Addison Kofal. Congratulations on earning academic all state honors from the Golf Coaches Association of Wisconsin. 
Hold on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, congrats, everyone. Awesome. Okay, so next we move to core agenda items, and it's a consideration of designating a WASD annual convention delegate. You got it. All eyes are on you, Josh. They always are, but you got it. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting there, in there. I don't even know that I'm going. <laughs> yeah. I what you say. Yeah. It's it's a poor choice. <laughs> well, I'm going to record it. <laughs> I'll be in the answer. What's, what's the backup plan if you can't attend for sure? You have an alternate. There's an alternate. Okay. Then, sure. I'd be honored. <laughs> they said it's going to be shorter. In uh -huh. all yeah. alternate. Is there two two board okay, members that go in? Long for CISA this time. No, I told well, anybody can watch in the gallery. Only one good. can have a vote. Okay. Oh, got it. Okay, yeah. And I I'll have, have a much cooler uh, lanyard than you will. He's going to get. <laughs> I'll have an extra one because I'll be the alternate, so I'll have the alternate <laughs> and the delegates. Mm. Yeah. Hockey. <laughs> Uh, so we need a motion, right? I motion that Lance. I can. I, I can do it. I can do it. Okay. Really no, I'm probably you be the alternate. That's good. Or I'm Jeff probably going. Alternate. So I can do it. I would like to go. I motion that Lance is the delegate, with Josh as the alternate. <laughs> Second. Second. Uh, Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. <laughs> Right, here we go. Which day? This is it's that Wednesday. Wednesday. Thursday. Sure. This is the year to do it because after last oh, year's yeah. disaster, yeah. this is going to be the yeah. best one ever. Yeah. <laughs> this will be. I think it is. I think it is it the first afternoon. Yes, yeah, yeah, like I'll, I'll ask. So we I'll, I'll, I'll 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 I think we got an email too with or it was in the magazine. So just it might be Wednesday afternoon. So I think that Tuesday night they have like a training yeah. or you can go and ask questions and then I'm not concerned. Yeah. All right. Josh can do that. So we're good with that. We've got a slate That's of votes. Uh, or B through A through I, I isn't it? No. no. B through K plus B. Yes. Oh B, yeah, B. I will move to approve core agenda items B through K and B. Second. All right, so Lance made the motion. Derek second it. Any more discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. And let me just look at the consideration of the first readings. Moving on then to the future agenda items. Any? All right, hearing none, then we can go to the um, important upcoming dates. December 13th is our regular school board meeting here at 7 p.m. at the district office. Uh, January 17th through the 19th is the WASD State Convention. And then January 24th is the school board meeting at 7 at the district office. But I think what the fourth or the fifth is board, board development. Board development. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I think I'm gone. Yeah. For what January fourth? January, January fourth and fifth. No, February. 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 I think it's February fourth. And we know we didn't put a meeting out for a strategic plan, like to reconvene. The other stuff we can work on. I think we need to. Yeah, we need to get it ready to. Published too. Would you want to meet next? I mean, we were meeting all May in December, yeah. regular. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can you schedule that, please? Oh, wait, December at six o'clock, the regular. Uh, yeah, at six o'clock. December 13th, the strategic plan at six at the district office. Okay, so that's moving on to January 4th is a Friday. No, 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 February. February. Oh, February 4th. Yeah, yeah. we'll you'll be here for that. For a Sunday, yeah. So we're going to Sunday. Yeah. So actually, maybe I'll, I'll be on a snowmobile trip with customers. Oh, we do it. Mm. It starts at five thirty. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I won't yeah. be here that day. I'm. I got a trip scheduled up north. 
That's right. We'll it's... look at that. Yeah, yeah. We have plenty of time. To... Okay. So, closed session. We want to make a motion. We read the whole spiel. Make a motion. We move. We convene a closed session. Per Wisconsin State Statute 19.18, 19.85. Dash one dash C, considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility. I, superintendent's quarterly review of goals. Second. Okay. Made the motion. Jeff, second. Discussion. All right. Roll call. Aye. 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 All right. So we're into.